Bajaj Auto has announced its entry into the 400cc segment with its partnership with Triumph Motorcycles. Yes, both companies have launched 400cc motorcycles in India and this is Triumph's first launch in the 400cc segment and this uh, launch is happening in India first. With us right now to talk about this launch and why it's important for Triumph and Bajaj Auto is none other than Raji Bajaj, the Managing Director of Bajaj Auto. Uh, Mr. Bajaj, thank you very much for joining us. The, the pricing first, how difficult was it to keep the price at this level? How do you see the competition in the 400cc segment now? It's going to be a three-way contest. Well, Parishit, first of all, um, you know, we already have our own brand, the Domina 400, and of course the KTM 400s uh, in this segment. So the segment is not new to us as such. Um, for us, it is not just a new partnership, new products, but also a new plant uh, at Chakhan, our second plant there. And I think we've done a great job. I must congratulate uh, Joe and Pradeep and the teams for having done a fabulous job, uh, both as R&D and as supply chain, um, to have been able to achieve. What I would candidly say are the highest specs we have ever been challenged to achieve, particularly in terms of aesthetics of design uh, that Triumph has expected of us. And at the same time to have done it, as you say, at such a competitive cost. Uh, you know, it's really remarkable. I think it sets a new standard. And I think it's fair to say that without setting new standards like this, it is very hard to compete in a cluttered and mature space. So uh, it's taken five years. Um, as I like to say on a lighter tone, uh, you know, we first met with Triumph in 2006, although the, uh, sorry, 2007, although the project was kicked off only in 2017. Uh, so in a way, it's taken 16 years. Uh, to come to this day uh, after we first started. So that's a world record in itself mm -hmm. that a partnership has taken 16 years to fructify into actual product. But yes, very competitive products both in terms of performance and cost. Right. So you were already there in the 390 segment, 400cc <coughs> segment with the KTMs at the Dominar. Uh, KTM possibly the more adventure off-roader segment. Why did you go ahead for these motorcycles You've got Royal Enfield, which is a market leader here with a 90% market share. Do you, did you feel that Royal Enfield, in a way, is unchallenged? Did you, did you see space here? Uh, why the 400cc segment? Because this is where Harley Davidson and Hero Motor Corp are also investing. Parikshit, this needs a little longer answer. In the sense, in 2007, we were working towards our strategy to be what we had defined as being the most versatile and complete motorcycle manufacturer in the world. So we knew that with our own brand, we could uh, address the mass premium and the mass space. You know, but to uh, address advanced markets and the premium or lifestyle segment, we didn't think, quite frankly, that our brand could carry itself there. Mm -hmm. Of course, we could have designed the products uh, for those segments, as we did eventually with KTM and Triumph, but we would not have pricing power uh, you know, if we went in the Bajaj brand. So we said to ourselves that, uh, you know, I'm a believer in the maxim that the opposite of a truth is another profound truth. You know, Niels Bohr said this. So we said to ourselves, there will be two mindsets at the two ends of the spectrum. Uh, a very sporty racing mindset, and the brand for that is KTM like no other. And then there will be the very classic uh, mindset uh, for cool riding, if I may call it that. And there is no brand, in my view, better than Triumph to address that space. So that is how, in 2007, we actually met up with uh, both these companies. With KTM, things progressed faster, but uh, nevertheless, we followed with Triumph afterwards. As far as Royal Enfield is concerned, you know, I say to people that uh, when the, in the U.S., when the uh, bank robber Willie Sutton was asked, uh, why do you rob the bank? Uh, and he uh, said quite simply, because that's where the money is. You know, so I would say to you that today between Bajaj, TVS, um, uh, Enfield and Hero, Bajaj has about 50% share of the profit of the industry, mm -hmm. um, you know. Um, but there are two profit pools, large profit pools outside uh, of this, which have been elusive. Mm -hmm. One is the Splendor um, and one is the Royal Enfield. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, with this brand, uh, the consumer will give us the license to compete in, in the space that uh, Royal Enfield has done so exceedingly well in. I mean, hats off to Siddharth what he's achieved. Um, and hopefully we can make some impact there. Right, so you said that if uh, Royal Field is where the money is, you'd like to rob the bank. Mm. But uh, 
this segment, according to a number of reports, the 350cc segment is growing at a CAGR of 10%, 9 to 10% per year. How big is this buy, the 350cc segment uh, plus buy, and how much are you hoping to capture with these motorcycles? Well, um, I think in volume terms, uh, currently this probably represents 10% of the industry, of the domestic industry, because as you know, the uh, bottom of the industry has shrunk a bit. So the, the, the bigger motorcycles probably represent close to 10%. Of course, as you said, Royal Enfield is uh, head and shoulders above everyone there. Uh, but that's in volume terms. In terms of revenue um, and profits, uh, as we just said, uh, it's much larger than, than 10%. So this is a huge opportunity mm -hmm. for any motorcycle maker. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of what impact we will have, uh, you know, this only time can tell. I can only say that uh, we have an initial capacity at our new plant for 5,000 triumphs a month. Mm -hmm. Hopefully in three or four months, we are able to scale up to that volume. We have to do it carefully because again, new plant, new people, new partnership, new product, new standards. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there onwards, um, uh, if the domestic demand continues to expand, and of course, uh, I think from October or November, we expect uh, Triumph orders to come in from all over the world. I'm told there's a lot of excitement building up in Triumph markets across the world. So then, you know, who knows uh, where that might take us, but uh, we will scale up very rapidly mm. uh, to satisfy that demand. Right. Uh, you said Chakra 2 can go up to, from 25,000, it can go up to 45,000 and maybe even double that. What, what could you take the Chakra 2 capacity? So today it's at 25,000, but that includes about 20,000 for KTM because uh, there are months uh, where we do about 20,000 KTM between domestic and exports and 5,000 for Triumph. So that's the construct today. Uh, in the next expansion, it can go to 40,000 between these two brands. Uh, and in the long term, it could even go to 80,000, which is a million motorcycles a year. Mm -hmm. It was always our dream that one day a million KTMs and Triumphs will roll out of India. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think uh, we are, we are uh, on our way to realize this dream. Right. So the introductory, the first 10,000 customers will get an introductory price of 2.23 lakhs. Uh, how do you think the Triumph Speed 400 is positioned against the Harley Hero Motocop X440, uh, one of your main rivals in the market, and also the Himalayan, which is priced at about 2.15 lakhs. Well, I think uh, <clears throat> they are all uh, three the same but different. Uh, the reason I say this is because if I just were to take, for example, the two new entrants, Harley and Triumph, I think what they have in common clearly is that they are both very big authentic brands, tremendous legacy and heritage, and they are basically in the same mind space as far as the consumer is concerned. So that's what they have in common. Mm. But I think in terms of product as opposed to brand, I think they have taken two almost diametrically opposite routes uh, from what I have seen uh, of the Harley uh, day before. I have not seen the actual product, but from what I have seen in the news, the Harley is, uh, uh, you know, leveraging displacement, 30% more displacement, and hence that uh, the performance that brings, etc. Whereas with uh, Triumph, you can see uh, two or three aspects which are uh, different and very distinctively Triumph. One is the very typical Triumph design or styling, the silhouette, mm -hmm. uh, which is unmistakable. Uh, then the attention to detail. Uh, there is so much detail of such a high standard on this product. I mean, it's exquisite. Mm -hmm. And thirdly. It's not so much about the displacement, which is also up 15% at 400cc, but you know, it's really a modern motorcycle. Um, and the proof of the pudding is that uh, Triumph wants to export this to all its markets across the world and stand side by side with their bigger bikes. And they would not do that mm -hmm. uh, unless it was really the same bloodline. So mm -hmm. whether it's four valve, water cooled, ride by wire, six speed gearbox, and all of 40 horsepower, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a top of the line motorcycle. Right. Uh, exports are going to begin soon, probably by the uh, end of the year. Are you expecting a certain export volumes from Triumph? Have you uh, got a fair idea as of now? Uh, and we believe this is going to be exported to all Triumph markets in the world, including the UK and the United States. I am given to believe by uh, Nick, my counterpart there, CEO of Triumph, that this will indeed go to uh, all Triumph markets across the world. Um, <clears throat> I don't know uh, what their estimates for uh, uh, exports is and I think I would not be wrong if I said that they would be a little unsure themselves 
because I have been through this experience with KTM in 2007 when smaller KTMs at these price points uh, was something uh, that was completely uh, uncharted waters for them, you know. So equally for Triumph, a 400cc at this sort of a price point for exports is just completely unfamiliar territory. Mm -hmm. So it becomes very difficult mm -hmm. in this kind of a, uh, you know, white space mm -hmm. to uh, guesstimate what might happen. Right. But I think, as you say, we will know better by the end of the year. Right. Uh, I would also like to ask you about expanding the touch points. What Hero Motor Corp is doing, uh, that in addition to Harley's existing 25 dealerships, they will be retailing the X440 in at least 300 premium uh, outlets of Hero <coughs> stock me. in the next one year or so. This is how they want to get scale and increase the footprint. What about Triumph? How will you be retailing Triumph? Is there a plan to sell it alongside Bajaj uh, or motorcycles or will it be exclusively through Triumph? So of course, I guess there's more than one way to do this. Uh, in uh, our case, Parikshit, our belief is that, you know, what is the difference between a brand and a product? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we use these words interchangeably. Mm -hmm. So to my mind, a brand is equal to, of course, product plus the story of the brand mm -hmm. plus the consumer experience mm -hmm. that comes with the brand <laughs> every time you interact with it as a product or communication or clubs or whatever it is. So in keeping with this approach, mm -hmm. uh, Triumph is very clear that uh, Triumph motorcycles will be sold uh, exclusively through Triumph dealerships. So there will be no Triumph motorcycles in Bajaj uh, dealerships or in KTM dealerships, where, which is uh, dedicated to KTM and Husqvarna, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> because those two brands belong to, to KTM. Um, so we are going to expand, I think, the existing 16 or so Triumph dealerships, which have existed for the big bikes. Um, I don't know uh, how soon, but in a matter of months to, I think, about a uh, hundred odd uh, dealerships. That in will, one month? Uh, no, in a few months' time, um, to about a hundred odd dealerships, which will be carrying only Triumph. Uh, many of them, which are in the metros, will carry the big Triumphs as well as these Triumphs, um, uh, middleweight Triumphs, uh, whereas those that are in the relatively smaller places, as you can imagine, will carry... Uh, largely the smaller ones, mm -hmm. uh, the, the 400s, uh, maybe one or the other of the, uh, the big one. But uh, the short answer is the Triumphs will only be sold through Triumph dealerships. Right. Now, uh, coming to the collaboration, you've said this has taken five years of work and you explained that meeting the standards, the fit and finish uh, of the product was, was very, very difficult and your technology team uh, had to go through a lot to get things right. Give us a sense of how much has Bajaj Auto invested in this and what is the kind of investment that has come from Triumph? I can give you this number that in setting up uh, the new plant at Chakhan, um, which includes the land building and the equipment we have put in, uh, that's a little over 200 crores of rupees. Um, and, uh, you know, quite frankly, ours is not a very capex intensive business. Uh, that's why we are still sitting on 18,000 crores of cash uh, at the end of it. Um, but having said that, um, it is very difficult to say how much of that investment is Triumph specific mm -hmm. because as, uh, as you can imagine, through the same assembly line, through the same paint line and sometimes through the same machining lines mm -hmm. will go uh, the KTM also and also the Triumph mm -hmm. which change in uh, jigs or fixtures or hangers or uh, you know, uh, other tools. So uh, I can't say this investment is only for KTM or this is only for Triumph. So whether it's the people at the plant, the equipment, the plant itself, even our supplier investments and uh, uh, even at the front end, although the physical dealerships are separate, very often there is the same dealer mm -hmm. uh, standing behind that, mm -hmm. uh, who is a Bajaj dealer, a Chetak dealer, a Triumph and a KTM dealer. So the investments are largely common. Mm -hmm. uh, I would also like to ask you, you when you speak about uh, the Triumph motorcycles, about expanding the partnership going forward. Are we going to see uh, a motorcycle per year? Because if this product is successful, how would you like to grow the collaboration, make it more successful? Driving exports is very important for Bajaj Auto. It is the largest exporter of motorcycles from India. So what more, what next in this partnership? So uh, currently Triumph has addressed, I think, uh, or prioritized the two uh, most important segments, uh, the street segment or the roadster mm -hmm. um, and the sort of scrambler or on-off road. Uh, 
but as they showed us in their presentation, you know, they are into adventure um, uh, motorcycles, into cafe racers, uh, and so many other uh, form factors as well. So uh, this is a question, quite frankly, as the brand custodian, they have to answer. I am not at a liberty to share any details, but I can tell you there are several uh, new products uh, that are in the pipeline. And um, I would think that one new product a year would be the minimum because if for no other reason mm. uh, but two, one, this is, India is the world's largest market uh, for these motorcycles mm. uh, and certainly there's more than one or two kinds of consumers there. Um, uh, and, and secondly, if we are going to ask our dealers to put up uh, exclusive dealerships, then certainly we have to make the effort to put more than just uh, two motorcycles out there uh, for them to generate uh, adequate business. All right. So, what is uh, Raji Bajaj's heart really on? There are so many motorcycles they have showcased. Uh, what would you like to bring to India next? Even if you don't want to give us a specification, tell us about uh, your next favorite motorcycle. Give us a, give us some hint of what could come next. Uh, well, that's a tricky question, but I will say this: we have something very special in the works. Uh, Within, within this fiscal year, uh, towards the end of it hopefully, uh, for, for those who absolutely love the Pulsar, mm. uh, the next big thing uh, with the Pulsar. So uh, we've done, I think, a reasonable job with the Triumphs. It's no secret that there's new KTMs around the corner because the whole KTM lineup uh, will be refreshed significantly in, in coming months. But uh, in the end, the one brand or product mm. which in 2001 changed Bajaj from a scooter company to a motorcycle company and from a domestic company to a global company as the world's favorite Indian and today the most valuable two and three wheeler company in the world uh, is Pulsar. Mm. So we are going to uh, pay homage to the Pulsar in an amazing way, uh, hopefully before March next year. Okay, so that's something we look forward to. Uh, I would come back to the point about pricing. When you, when you think about having the cheapest motorcycle or the lowest cost motorcycle, the high lige, highest mileage motorcycle, you think about the entry level segment, really the bread and butter segment. When you see, think about iconic brands like the Triumph, uh, the Harley Davidson, you think about the most premium, the most cream uh, customer in the market. So when you have this price for and you have companies saying that this is the lowest price Harley or this is the cheapest Triumph ever. Do you think this strategy can work with a customer, with a with a customer who who aspires to buy a Triumph one day or own a Harley Davidson one yeah. day? I think you know what is uh, quote unquote cheap for one person mm. is a fortune for another. Mm. You know, so it all depends on one's own context. Mm. And actually, the reason for the success of our partnership with KTM, which saw KTM go from sixty-five thousand motorcycles a year in two thousand seven. Mm to becoming the number one premium motorcycle in the world by volume now at over 300,000 motorcycles a year mm -hmm. is because we did not uh, uh, comply with this uh, implicit assumption mm -hmm. that you can either buy something that's affordable mm -hmm. or something that is aspirational. Mm -hmm. What KTM Bajaj brought to the table, mm -hmm. and if I may say so, then uh, motivated TVS, BMW, and even Bajaj Triumph mm -hmm. uh, to come together. Um, was to be able to, to offer affordable inspiration, let's say, or affordable aspiration uh, to that customer, uh, you know. And uh, I think that's what we are doing with Triumph. I don't think we are offering uh, a premium product. I don't think we are offering a cheap product. We are offering great value uh, for a great brand and a great product. Uh, and it's still at a small premium to the uh, current market leader, but that's because there's a hell of a lot more content on, on the Triumph motorcycle. Right. Now, Triumph, as Nick pointed out in the, in the press conference, has invested in this partnership with the George Auto because they see great value in India as a market going forward. Uh, how will this partnership grow? What is your uh, view on it? Right now, Bajaj Auto is a contract manufacturer for Triumph motorcycles. Uh, possibly in future, there will be more mo motorcycles which will be made here at Chaka 2. Could you get into an equity partnership the way you have a partnership with KTM? Would you want to buy a stake in Triumph in future? Are those kind of conversations going on? Like you said, it was your dream, uh, a 16-year-old dream to partner with Triumph and deliver these motorcycles. Uh, are you considering buying a stake? 
Well, first I must uh, say this, that uh, if I were a contract maker, mm. I would essentially be building to print, mm. um, you know, that Triumph would supply us. Mm. <coughs> Excuse my cough. <clears throat> but that's not the case. Um, I would not be wrong in saying that uh, first, as far as uh, R&D or design development is concerned, mm. uh, while as brand custodians, everything is defined by Triumph. Mm. But if I were to uh, guesstimate the share of man hours that have gone into designing, developing, prototyping, mm -hmm. testing, etc. of these motorcycles, probably 80% of those man hours mm -hmm. have been invested over here by, by Bajaj engineers. These are ground up motorcycles. So, so brand new motorcycle and, and that's the effort we put in, in, in developing them. Otherwise, we, if these were completely designed and developed by Triumph in the UK, we would not have hit this sweet spot in mm -hmm. terms of cost. Number two, as you're probably aware, that the Indian market, the subcontinent, most markets in Africa and a couple of markets of LATAM and uh, ASEAN will be managed directly by Bajaj in terms of all marketing, sales, everything. Mm. So we are the, if I may say so, the brand custodians of Triumph. For example, we will be so in Colombia, we will be so in Myanmar, Cambodia and as I said in the subcontinent, mm. etc. So if you're a contract manufacturer, you do not participate in design and you certainly don't uh, mm. manage the market. Mm. Uh, having said that, uh, the, at this moment, there is no equity relationship. I don't think um, uh, equity in itself is a necessary condition uh, for a successful partnership. Mm. We have a 40 year partnership still enduring with Kawasaki. Um, uh, today it is uh, manifested in terms of Kawasaki being uh, our distributor in the Philippines mm -hmm. and there is no equity that either company has I in each other. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, I have always believed that uh, mutuality mm -hmm. uh, of purpose of objective in the marketplace is a far bigger objective and a far more compelling reason mm -hmm. for two partners to stay together. Mm -hmm. Otherwise if you look at the history of the Indian uh, motorcycle industry, Hero Honda, Kinetic Honda, LML Vespa, Escorts Yamaha, TVS Suzuki, mm. LML uh, uh, and the Korean maker uh, Dailem or whoever, none of these exist. These mm. were all equity relationships. Mm. The only one that endures is Bajaj Kawasaki that was not an equity relationship. Mm. Uh, so I would like to ask you, you've got a partnership, very successful partnership with Kawasaki, very successful partnership with KTM and a successful partnership with Triumph going forward. Are there new collaborations, new partnerships that you are considering? Uh, either through an equity route or through uh, a technology partnership? Uh, yes and no. Uh, no in the sense that, uh, as I said, we wanted to be a complete uh, motorcycle maker. I think between Bajaj, KTM and Triumph, we are there. So, mm -hmm. so in that sense, no. But yes, in the sense that KTM themselves, for example, uh, today own not just the KTM brand, which is primarily an off-road or racing brand, as you said, but also the Husqvarna brand, which mm. is a very urban, mm. uh, chic brand, mm. uh, Gas Gas, which is a very specialized trail brand. Mm. Uh, there may be others tomorrow. Mm. I don't know what Triumph's pl plans are, mm. but maybe uh, to expand the Triumph business, maybe for the electric business, maybe they will acquire something uh, difficult to, for me to say. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, yes, mm -hmm. uh, we may get involved in more brands in the future. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that will help us to address whatever little niches, edges, corners are left out mm -hmm. of this uh, motorcycle pie that we want to participate in so completely. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as someone said, life should be not necessarily perfect, but whole, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so we won't say we make the most perfect motorcycles, but I think we are a very wholesome motorcycle company. Right. Mr. Bajaj, my final two questions, and this would be on uh, the EV roadmap. Uh, the industry has seen a drop in sales on a year-on-year -year basis after the subsidies uh, were cut down. It has been a drastic cut for many automakers. Has the loss per vehicle for EVs gone up? And how do you see the competition in the market? Do you feel that Bajaj Auto now has a need to uh, ramp up and really pull up its strategy considering you've got some uh, entrants like Ola which are now dominating the market. Ola has a 40% market share. Yeah. So as uh, Rakesh said on your channel a couple of days back, um, if you average uh, the uh, sales in May and June, uh, that average is uh, pretty much the same. Uh, as what we witnessed in April or the months before that. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the market did react in June uh, uh, very sharply, adversely to the price increase. Uh, but I think it will, it will come back because 
the opex in terms of the savings to the consumer if he moves from ice scooter to a ev scooter is still uh, positive mm. so we must believe in that logic uh, uh, that consumers would see that and would come back uh, in terms of the loss per vehicle it is not any more really because uh, largely the reduction in the uh, uh, subsidy has been passed on mm. um, not all of it but at the same time it's no secret that the sell prices have also moderated so mm. if you look at the total cost picture mm. i don't think uh, we are any worse off than we were before uh, but uh, at higher prices mm. now in terms of our own ambitions going forward we've always said we are not trying to become the number one in this space overnight um, we want to tread cautiously ensure product quality uh, again customer experience is very important to us so if that means that uh, we are going to be at about 15% share or 20% share which is where we are in the cities in which we are present i believe we are at about 20% share then i consider this to be a healthy market share because then you are top of mind as the top 2 top 3 choices of the customer and then uh, we will scale up at the appropriate time right and finally do you feel that you stand vindicated uh, because you always have maintained over the past few years that you don't feel the need to raise capital from outside for your electric vehicle program. We have seen some companies deferring front fundraising plans considering the market conditions right now. So do you feel that was the right strategy for Bajaj Auto? Are you going to stick with it? Well, not vindicated in the sense I wasn't trying to prove a point, uh, but I was just making an honest statement that uh, Number one, as I said, we are not a, um, uh, in a capital intensive business, uh, unlike say the car industry. Uh, number two, in Bajaj Auto's case, we are sitting on a lot of cash. Mm -hmm. And number three, most importantly to me, um, whether the money in the business is ours or somebody else's, uh, doesn't change my attitude towards the money. In fact, if it's your money that I'm employing in my business, I must do so with a greater sense of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So we are not, um, uh, you know, conditioned <laughs> by the mindset that there is some cheap, easy money floating around somewhere. So uh, one can uh, burn this cash because it's not yours, so to speak. Mm -hmm. This is not where uh, one comes from, uh, old-fashioned as it may sound. But to that extent, I think uh, uh, by having that uh, discipline in mind, mm -hmm. we made the right choices. Um, and uh, yes, that seems to be playing out now. Right. Uh, Mr. Jaj, thank you so much for talking to us here on CNBC, telling Always us about the strategy with these two new motorcycles as well. Thank you so much, Parish.